Welcome back, nerds. Fino here with a guide for Jacques Demolay. She's a five-star limited foreigner introduced in the Halloween Rising event. She's big on curses and to show she means business, she's brought out an intensely cursed combination, being a quick AoE foreigner. From Voyager to Mysterious Idol X Altar, every installment of this trilogy has been a bit of a disappointment. But let's see if the old Grandmaster can break the trend. Leading Jacques' skill set is Investiture in Depravity. It's a 3-turn party attack and crit damage buff with 20% party charge and, very interestingly, it applies the evil alignment to your frontline. We'll talk about some of the stranger applications of this skill later, but what you need to know up front is that Jock herself provides a benefit to evil allies, so it's in your interest to use this before her second skill. That would be Holy Shroud. False. It's a single turn invulnerability and 30% battery for herself. It also applies a single hit invuln to any evil allies. If you used Investiture first, that would be everyone else. Unfortunately, the ally invuln disappears for a single turn, so you typically have to choose between this protection and using the battery to keep your Noble Phantasm combo going. Jacques de Molay's third skill is Innocent Monster. It starts by giving 10 stars per turn, a personal quick buff, and increased damage against cursed enemies. In around two years from now, we'll get the FG Arcade collab event, and this comes with an upgrade to Innocent Monster. In addition to everything else, it'll preemptively curse enemies on Jacques' basic attacks, so even the first card gets the curse bonus. Neat stuff, and I'll get to its implications. But for the time being, I'll be working under the assumption that you don't have this upgrade. You may have noticed that on release, Jacques doesn't have a curse in her skills. That's the responsibility of her noble phantasm. Fuck you, I'm not pronouncing that. Friday the 13th is the dreaded AoE quick attack. It applies a 5 turn, 1000 damage curse to go along with its 5 turn curse amplifier. Its overcharge grants a preemptive, multi turn NP damage effect. Not only does this mean that Malay's damage increases over the course of a loop, but her buff combination lets her hit every relevant buff category. Not too shabby. There is a catch, though. The curse on Friday the 13th only procs after your damage is dealt. And if your target isn't cursed, your damage is going to be rough as all hell. For comparison, a Voyager with his NP upgrade does like 30% more damage than Jacques, if neither of them have their desired targets. But wait a second, Fino. Comparing an upgraded and a basic NP isn't fair. Alright, try this on for size. Malay maintains a very small damage lead on Mysterious Idol X Altar, despite being a whole rarity above her. The picture gets a lot better with the curse buff, but remember, on release, Jacques de Molay needs to NP to put a curse on her target so she can then do reasonable NP damage. You see the problem with that. At minimum, that means her turn 1 damage is going to be in the toilet without an external curse to kick things off. So between now and that all-important upgrade, you'll have to scrape up some curses. Thankfully, FGO has a good number of curse command codes that act as a band-aid. Bestial Talisman was available recently, so consider that as your starting point. By hitting your opponent with a face card and then chaining into Friday the 13th, you can get reasonable NP damage even on turn 1. If you're feeling up to it, you can even give these codes to your supports just to make sure that a bricked hand doesn't lead into a bricked run. For another option against boss fights, consider running an Expendable Servant with 500 Year Obsession. When its carrier dies, it applies a 2 turn NP seal and a 10 turn curse, letting you keep your enemy primed for up to 2 activations of Innocent Monster. You know, I got to thinking. What exactly is Jacques de Molay's role? With the starting charge of pen skill, Jacques can potentially Scotty loop generic enemies with 50% CEs, something like Traces of Christmas's past. But this isn't a Summer Okitan situation where she holds her ground against the arts meta. Foreigners are always in a bit of an awkward spot farming-wise since almost every class does extra damage against Zerks. It's just a matter of getting around the fact that you get less charge for hitting Berserkers. For this reason, Avengers are usually the extra class of choice for dealing with these troublesome enemies. On the other hand, Jacques' margins are tight so I'd hesitate to use her against Berserkers without a super scope. So she's not anything special in the farming department. There's that curse theme, but consider this. It took them two years to figure out that, hey, maybe she should have more than one way of getting a curse on her target. If you want to focus on exploiting that curse amp, you're very much incentivized to spam her Noble Phantasm. Slightly unfortunate for a quick servant, but not entirely out of the question. Luckily for you, team building for this is exactly the same as it is for farming. Two Scotties. FGO's a very complex game, I swear. If there's an upside, it's this. There's going to be a second Scotty released next summer. Then you can just find someone who's a Malay enthusiast and borrow theirs instead of going through the trouble of raising your own. In general, I don't recommend Malay for curse memes. If you really want to get into that style of gameplay, consider waiting for the alter ego Taisui, who comes out early next year. He has a very unique, contagious curse mechanic that's way more fun to use. And as an art servant, he's much better equipped to spam his effects. Back to Malay, if your hipster gline is tingling, you might think to take advantage of that Entity of the Outer Realm passive and run Jacques de Molay with Van Gogh. Her Noble Phantasm grants a boatload of crit damage to anyone with that checkbox ticked. But here's the thing. Jacques de Molay wants to curse enemies to activate her damage amplifier and also make use of her curse amp. 
Van Gogh, on the other hand, wants to suck up all the curses on the field to boost her battery. What Van Gogh doesn't want is to absorb a 1k curse and eat that damage. So don't get fooled by the surface level synergy. I consider the two quite incompatible in practice. Speaking of Van Gogh, I did a servant guide on her and you would not believe how many people swear that she and Ashia Doman are this really amazing combo. They're wrong and we'll deal with that can of worms one of these days, but unlike Van Gogh, Mole actually does have what I consider an interesting synergy with the pervert of Shimosa. Recall that Jacques can apply the evil trait to our allies. Well, Doman provides attack and crit damage to evil allies. He's got a curse package as well, which Mole appreciates. Doman's buff suite doubles up on chaotic evil servants. Now Jacques is neutral evil, so she can't capitalize on that benefit, but what she can do is give the evil trait to chaotic allies, making them qualify for the double buff. It's not all profit, though. Looking at the list of chaotic non-evil servants, very few of the attackers strike me as particularly synergistic. Certainly not to the degree that would justify running such an awkward frontline. One that did stand out to me was Saber Musashi. She has high damage potential, but no native crit or attack steroids. Well, Domen and Jacques can provide both in spades. If you slap some 2030s on them, Musashi can just go off and cut everyone to ribbons like a psychopath. Mysterious Heroine X is in a similar situation, having only a single standard attack buff. You know what's funny though? Scotty? She's chaotic alignment. Both of her. So when you inevitably bring Scotty along to this team anyway, she can technically benefit. As far as I can tell, the face card oriented style of play is Jacques de Molay's most impactful. You can start your chains with her noble phantasms to get a curse going, and then ride off your damage amplifier to get some good hits in, especially in combination with Scotty's buff suite. Once we get mighty chains, going NP Arts Buster will translate into a good chunk of damage. And once she gets her third skill upgrade, then you can start fights with a raw quick arts buster as well. Then you can swap out all your curse command codes for other shit. Maybe an NP gain option like Crest of the Titan's Pit. Doesn't matter all that much if you ask me. I've had Jacques Demolay since her JP release, and to be honest, I've never been all that impressed with the character's gameplay. Jacques does a little bit of everything, but doesn't dominate in any one category. What you get in effect are a bunch of gimmicks that go off in different directions. Kind of an NP spammer, kind of a curse memer, kind of a domain enabler, and kind of a face card beat stick. It's a lack of focus that bedevils her, and in combination to this year's onslaught of power picks, result in a servant that you can safely leave on the bench. Now you guys seem to like the history section from the Zenobia video, so let's go for another. Again, with some caveats. Firstly, I'm not a real historian. This is just the story as I know it. Secondly, medieval Europe isn't in my wheelhouse. I'm more of an antiquity kind of guy. So if any enthusiasts want to fill in the gaps down in the comments, I'd certainly appreciate it. With that said, here's what I know. Jacques de Molay was the Grand Master of the Knights Templar. They were an order established to protect pilgrims traveling to and around Jerusalem. They formed their organization on a spot near Solomon's Temple, and this is reflected in their full name. The Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon. Pretty unwieldy, which is why everyone just calls them the Knights Templar. They didn't have much to start, hence the poor part. And that was a problem. Fielding a knight in the Middle East is expensive as hell. The equipment, the animals, just keeping them in fighting shape in adverse conditions. It was a logistical headache, but the Templars got a few legs up. Over time, the popes gave them advantages, like the authority to raise their own money and also move through Europe without regard for the more worldly states occupying that land. On top of all this, the Templars developed what were essentially banking methods for the pilgrims and crusaders. A pilgrim carrying coin and treasure was prime pickings for bandits. That and they're stuck carrying around all this shit. To get around this, the Knights Templar would let the pilgrims deposit their valuables before setting out, and they'd give them a letter saying how much they put in. Once they got to their destination, they could withdraw money against the amount listed in that letter. Between this and the logistics of running their army, the Templar organization got very, very good at making money. They had their banking, they owned a lot of land that produced value, and apparently they just straight up did money lending. Which is kind of impressive because last I checked, that was a taboo thing around this time period. But the point is that the Knights Templar had an army, and an astronomical amount of money for a non-state organization. Down the road their military fortunes would take a nosedive. That's just kind of how the Crusades went. Like sequels to a hit movie, with each one wowing less, and doing worse at the box office than the last. Like Jaws. And much like Jaws, we don't talk about the fourth one. But by the late 1200s, Jacques de Molay had inherited a situation where the Knights Templar were in the process of being forced out of the Middle East altogether. They'd been corralled onto Cyprus with very few footholds on the continent. In fact, it was under Molay's tenure that they lost their final foothold, an island off the coast of Syria. But Jacques de Molay was intent on turning things around, and became involved in an audacious plan to combine the forces of his knights, the Cypriots, Armenians, and, get this, Mongols. At this point in time, branches of the Mongol Empire had reached all the way to the Mediterranean, and they were known as absolutely brutal warriors of the highest caliber, held back only by a love of drink and a tendency for their states to infight. So if Molay could make this alliance stick, he'd have one hell of a force to go to war with. 
but it didn't stick, and after a bit of raiding, the forces he could assemble had to call it off. It was around this time that the Knights Templar became involved in regime change on Cyprus, participating in a coup against its king. It might have been the right tactical play, but this action played into the image of the Knights Templar as a boogeyman to the heads of Europe. You see, they were sweating because the Knights Templar had facilities all around the continent, the right to move their armies freely between countries, armies to move around freely, and now they just overthrew a head of state. One monarch in particular was sweating up a storm, Philip IV of France. Philip the Fair. Fair isn't good looking, by the way, not the just kind of fair as you're about to find out. You see, Philip had a lot of wars to fight. He had to finish one in Spain and he started two. One against Flanders, part of modern-day Belgium, and another against England. These wars were outrageously expensive, and Philip was always on the hunt for cash to fund his military adventures. And a couple of times, he'd do this by picking even more fights against the Lombards, the Jews, and eventually the Knights Templar. You see, Philip the Fair had wanted to borrow an astronomical sum from the Templars, and for their part, the Knights Templar had made the fatal mistake of agreeing to give him the money. Philip could pay it back, I guess, or he could do the other thing. So while Jacques de Molay was in France for a funeral, Philip ordered for all the Templars in the country to be arrested. On what charges? Heresy. Rumors of one kind or another had always swarmed around this curious organization, something that was essentially a medieval multinational corporation. So people had a suspicious eye towards them, and recently some disgruntled ex-members were saying that there was some nasty shit going on behind the scenes. That as part of their initiation, they were ordered to commit unnatural and unholy acts. Philip had no reason to believe any of this was true, but it made for a convenient excuse. The arrest was on Friday the 13th, which is where Jacques Noble Phantasm gets its name and the day may have obtained some of its unlucky connotation from its connection to the Templar's downfall. At this point, you might be wondering, why wasn't the Pope making more of a stink about these holy warriors getting manhandled? Well, that's because the papacy was reeling from an assault by... Philip the Fair! Dude, no one is safe from this guy! He kidnapped one Pope, who was so shocked by the experience that he died soon after, and rumor has it he poisoned another. This brings us to Clement V. He opted to set up shop in French territory instead of Rome, partially because Philip the Fair was flexing his muscles and partially because, from what I was reading, Rome in this period seemed like an ungovernable mess, with aristocrats and their armies openly fighting each other. This would begin something known as the Avignon Papacy, where the Pope operated out of France and, more importantly, under the French king's thumb. Essentially, the Pope was in a weak position and this let Philip dictate the tempo of what happened next. The Knights Templar stood accused of such activities as pissing on the cross, talking shit about Jesus, and kissing other dudes as part of their initiation like all over their bodies. If you're picturing sexy evil fate Jacques right now, hot. Old, balding 60-something Jacques, less odd. They were also accused of worshipping a weird goat demon by the name of Baphomet, which is the namesake of foreigner Jacques' little pet. Jacques and the other Knights Templar were tortured until they confessed to these activities. They took these confessions back in the presence of the Pope's men, but the damage was done, and eventually, the Pope called for the arrest of every member and the confiscation of the Order's property, not just in France, but all of Christendom. As for Jacques de Molay, his attempt to walk back his confession earned him a grisly fate, burning at the stake. As he was dying, he allegedly cursed the duplicitous king and the cowardly pope, shouting that within a year, they would answer for their crimes before God. And surely enough, both Philip the Fair and Clement V would die that very year. The moral of the story? Don't lend money to the French. But as you might surmise, the FGO Mobile version of Jacques de Molay is colored by those accusations of heresy and that final curse. FG Arcade, on the other hand, seems to have taken a more straightforward interpretation of the Templar Grand Master, minus the hairline. This video ended up being way longer than I expected, but let me know what you thought. Like if you enjoyed this video, subscribe for more, and come watch me on twitch.tv slash where I stream every weekend, 3pm Pacific Time, Friday through Sunday. I'll see you there.